how well we understand the past climate uh, changes and variations and all this other stuff that is ever changing is actually try to ask the question that perhaps the climax is, is, is though it's complex, there's no doubt. But what is the most obvious aspect of the climate system that we know? Season, isn't it? Day and night. What is these two things related to? One is related to how the earth rotates, right? Mm -hmm. The second one is really related to the sun. Most of it is related to sunlight, sunlight energy input to the system. So I've been studying the issues of how the sun affects the climate system for a very long time. I would say, well, you can more or less up to even 29 years now. It's a long time, I'm a slow learner, but then I want to be sure of what I'm learning, right? I don't want to spill something that is incorrect. So season is a very obvious thing. And how well we keep track of this season is we base on thermometer station basically, right? Or in, in the ocean, we, we try to measure something, especially when you have ships going around the world and they keep track of information. You know how warm the surface temperature is. And this day we need to know in depth how the temperature or chemistry or salt and property, how it changes, right? So we collected more and more information, try to understand how it works. But it's very clear that the whole system is dominated by season, really. In fact, one of the aspects that is so interesting that now we have a class of uh, data called the Argo buoy, ocean buoy. This is basically a robot that actually sit on the surface of the uh, surface and then go down to depth of almost like uh, 2,000 meters. Just for clarification, the average depth of the world ocean is on the order of 3,800 meters and we are only measuring first 2,000 meters. Go down for about a week and then come out and then relay the information. And we basically got close to about, I would say, uh, six, seven thousands of this buoy around the world now. And they relay the information to the, the pretty accurate now. We have for the last 10, 15 years, we have very good information. One of the most surprising things that uh, this Argo buoy that is rarely talked about is that it's not only finding, let's say, something obvious like the season temperature changes of the surface, but one group from Japan published a paper long ago that no one noticed, that I noticed, that they actually found that down in 2000 or 1800 meters or so within that region, you know, the nearest the end of the data. By the way, the reason why you cannot go deeper is because the pressure gets too strong, so they need to have a better equipment. That's part of the problem, right? The ocean can squeeze everything, so you got a lot of problem. And they found actually in the middle of the Pacific, it's not near any coastal region, but they found that the temperature there was doing this seasonal stuff. <laughs> that is the deepest puzzle. Because it cannot be explained even by the sunlight. Sunlight doesn't penetrate the top 100 meters of the ocean. That actually, I, I, I kind of spoke quickly, so I reverse engineering. In the beginning, I was studying how the sun radiation, you know, with the sun and earth orbit going around and then changing the seasonal sunlight. And then how the intrinsic changes of the sun itself, caused by the magnetism in the sun, is changing this output, the light output. So how they projected on the earth climate system. That was the beginning of just about everyone who wants to study this topic. But lately, I want to point out that this Argo data, it clearly shows you that all this direction that took me about 20 years, so my last 9 years is smarter than now, the 20 years, the <laughs> first 20 years, is to realize that you that is not adequate. Just treating the class of problem like that is not adequate. You have to treat how the whole system is coupled together. So the explanation of the, the best explanation of the seasonal cycle in that central Pacific is actually related to magnetic output from the bottom of the ocean. And I was able to co-locate the location of those seasonal, the strongest seasonal cycle, guess where it's located? It's near where the mid-ocean ridges is, where it's documented. Information on the mid-ocean ridges is very difficult to find. But we have now, beginning to have, simply because of interest in seismology, so that's another area. Remember, we're talking about climate system as a whole. You have to start even with solid earth physics, right? We have to know, we have to know how the magma works because we have to understand volcano. And then we have to understand not only the biology, mind you. So, so in that sense, I'm trying to say that the natural factor is overwhelmingly dominating the system. 
So my simple uh, theory or empirical evidence to support how climate varies is basically the whole seasonal evolution of the system. So there's no, in my view, there is no, uh, by the way, if you think of that aspect, ask yourself the question, when you throw in increase more or less CO2, how would it affect this thing? It's very hard to conceive of a way in which that it can change the season because what the sun is doing, it dominates everything. The sun supplies 99% of all our 0.5 basically. The little point something is basically from radiogenic heat from you know uranium and things like that. So in terms of energy of the whole budget of the whole system, there's just no way that this carbon dioxide would, would come into the energy budget and affect it somehow. No matter how you want to model it, the only way is to do it by cheating, obviously. You just treat everything else not changing and then change the carbon dioxide, change how you, you change the rate of the atmosphere cool itself. That's basically what the role of atmospheric carbon dioxide do to the, to the system. It doesn't change the energy. It can only reduce the rate of cooling. So therefore, when you reduce the rate of cooling, you turn it around, of course it's warming, right? But how it can change the rate of cooling it's completely controlled by how much energy you coming and not going by the sun. That's why it's, this is why no wonder that it is uh, almost like a truism, a very strong truism. Although as a scientist, you don't want to have any belief that you know the sun has to have some role. It is basically a scientist's role to try to figure out this whole thing has been in a long, long time. I mean, the ideas of season come from the word uh, well climate. The word climate come from the Greek word klima. It's actually related to sun angle of the sun, especially in the mid 90s, uh, mid 80s. That every time you, you try to model the whole atmosphere and, and never mind the ocean, just the atmospheric problem. That I say that the atmosphere in terms of layer, you have a region called troposphere, that's 10 kilometers or so. And then you have, uh, let's say 10 to 50, which is a stratosphere. You never, never, uh, understand why is it actually you cannot know but you have this general problem that hasn't been solved from day zero the first day this computer come out this computer climate model come out is that you measure the temperature in the stratosphere you will always find that the computer output this that you run this computer output is always colder than what is being measured which meaning meaning that the there's a general problem in the atmosphere what most scientists, serious scientists, has concluded is that basically the climate model doesn't have enough wave heating. You can imagine the wind come, they hit on the, some topography, some mountain side. You generate some specific wave. Those waves is not adequately modeled. That's another problem. This is why they have this general problem that has to be fixed before you even begin talking about anything, right? This is why, in fact, if to put it in context, most people say that, okay, you put uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, you warm the temperature in the troposphere by a few degrees, right? Temperature Celsius. And you ask yourself, what is all this general coolness problem? Uh, how much of a difference? They are of the order of 20 degrees, at least. So we're talking about something that really a big one that we have to really deal with this first. It just simply must not be allowed. But the problem is that all these computer, clever computer climate models and all these IPCC's uh, activists just sweep this under the floor. They say we know the problem. I remember vividly as a postdoctoral fellow giving one of these prestigious invited speech in Tenerife in Spain where I scheduled to be a speaker and I talk about this general coldness problem in climate models just to elude the whole community in solar physics including some earth sciences people because that meeting was all about that. And the former, the, back then he was the IPCC chairman, Sir John Houghton, raised his hand and complained to the whole audience as if that he's right. Why are you talking about this problem? We knew this problem for a long time. And as a young postdoc, I say, excuse me, sir, this problem has not been fixed, so I'm very worried. Here it goes, right? Who's right, who's wrong? Why would a IPCC chairman would say that this problem is not solved, it's okay, we know about it. Okay, just because you know about it, that just simply tell you how weak this computer climate model as a tool is. It's never been a tool. It's always been something to teach you about how the system, so there's a pedagogical aspect of this, how you use the computer uh, model, but not for, under, not even for understanding, simply because we don't know it yet, right? 
because you need a lot more empirical understanding collecting from all different kind of areas of observation that I told you about the ocean buoy from the most sophisticated type to nowadays all these studies about paleoclimate, right? And my specific area is of course how the sun affects the whole climate system. Yes, indeed. Through all this work that I did, by the way, it's very, very important. I got to take another step back. Really, really important. This is because the nature of how we acquire the information of what the temperature is on the climate system has been defined by this thing called the thermometer station, right? We have good 150 years or 100 years sort of data since 1850 or starting from 1900, pick the beginning, doesn't matter. Today, we have some data. And then you ask yourself, how good is this data to allow you to study the climate? You know, temperature, after all, is part of the climate, right? Remember, climate is more complicated than temperature. There's no doubt about it. But with these two great colleagues from Ireland, by the name of uh, Ronan and Michael Connolly, we've been systematically, and of course, many, many, many contributions from important colleagues like Dr. Professor Peter O'Neill and some of our Chinese colleagues in China, and we've been, and, and of course, the great friend of us, uh, Anthony Watts, who's been working very hard on uh, quantifying, classifying how this thermometer station across USA are they are they are they uh, fulfilling the what you call the the NOAA standard, the National Oceanic Administration, which is in charge of measurements, uh, whether they fulfill the standard that the thermometer station has to be like how many 1.5 meters above some clearings, that's one, so on and so forth, the quality of the data, so that we can try to pull out something called the climate part of the temperature data because most of the time the thermometer is not measuring climate because it's affected by all the changes in the local environment like pavement on the site for example the famous one is basically putting a thermometer station in one of the areas somewhere in in California near the fire station uh, and then put near the exhaust pipe of the engine and whatever all that problem Tell me, you can use the data to study climate? Absolutely not, isn't it? It will be a laughing stock. And these are the climate, this is why the problem of what we have today is that most scientists did not want to challenge those things. And then they also did not want to study the issue for themselves. They're just simply relegating the authority. In fact, science have no authority, I'm sorry. That's, the golden rule is the measurement, what the good data say. I mean, data is also have to classify in good data versus bad data. All the thermometer data is so difficult that you barely can use it to study climate. This is why when they claim the global warming is real, this and that, all this argument is a bit of a joke, right? Because they've been changing the data, first of all, and they're also using bad data. So therefore, it's a bit of a goobly duke. These people don't even know what they're doing. Essentially, this is why how the danger of the whole thing is. Most of these laymen, including all these thousands of Nobel Prize winners, you know, from these economic people who never understand what the thermometer data is being acquired, and they just refuse to look at the data, refuse to say that there's something wrong here, which is easily shown. I mean, my God, I should invite every single one of those Nobel Prize people to come, I'll show you all the thermometer data that's bad. Go look and tell me what you can use with this. Why are you so confident saying that you must have a prescription, cutting the carbon dioxide and solve the problem? No, 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 it doesn't work that way. It has to, whoever that make that claim, you better show me that they got the data right. So, long story short, <laughs> we work extremely hard to try to resolve this issue. So we have papers after papers. Now we are up to our third and fourth papers. We're gonna keep producing some papers simply to try to explain and then try to tease out the part where it's contaminated by non-climatic factors. And then those climatic factors that we can use to interpret and then try to model and the bottom line that you wanted to know is that if you want to explain what this temperature record has been doing over the past 150 or 100, uh, 100 years or so, uh, we can demonstrate and show and calculate and so on and so forth that it's largely explained by how the sun's uh, irradiance has been changing over time. And again, that doesn't mean the end of the story. The only thing that we say is that it would be extremely difficult to disprove the idea that the sun causes all these changes. That's the essence of the science. We're not there to prove a positive. We're trying to show that it's just very difficult to, to say the sun has nothing to do with it. 